Hi. Welcome to Artist and Critic. I'm Don Gray. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, why it's so difficult to have a significant art, why there's so little of it, perhaps uh, why we are in a period of artistic decadence, as, as I believe we are. Um, I just am back from viewing the Cezanne exhibition uh, for a second time, and uh, it occurs to me that an idea of some of the situation today in the art world, if you will imagine Cezanne trundling around Madison Avenue with a group of paintings and uh, imagining what kind of success he would have with his art in the galleries and even in the museum, which the Museum of Modern Art, which shows it uh, today. Uh, huge crowds are attending the uh, exhibition, great lines of people winding around 53rd Street on up Fifth Avenue. Uh, and it, I think it's telling us something about what Cezanne has to say, something of the impact that Cezanne has to say. And I venture to suggest that if Cezanne did try to go to uh, any of the fashionable galleries or many of the not so fashionable galleries, uh, I think you would find it uh, that he would have as much difficulty today having people see his work as he did in his own time. And he had his first one-man exhibition at the age of 56. Um, that's not exactly instant stardom. You know, we're used to these young uh, kids coming out of college uh, at the age of 25, 26 or so, and they have a museum retrospective. You know, they all 17 pictures that they painted since they were first year in art school are on display there. Uh, there have been articles. I remember recently uh, Hilton Kramer wrote an article in the Times. Uh, uh, there are more and more places to show your work. There are more and more opportunities for artists. And I say a flat no. No, there isn't. There are more and more opportunities for a certain kind of artist. And I believe that certain kind of artist is the less significant artist, the less uh, original artist, the less profound artist. Uh, we're in a, in a pit of uh, artistic incompetence, of uh, artists who really have nothing to say, who have lost contact with reality, with, with their own feelings, with their own uh, with the meaning of life, and they are simply uh, working with fads, with fashions, with um, aesthetic manipulation of whatever materials. And uh, among those artists, I, I, well, let's go back to the Museum of Modern Art. Before you go into the Cezanne exhibition, there are recent acquisitions on display, as you're familiar with that museum. Um, and there's a very geometric picture by Agnes Martin, totally white, a little textural manipulation, uh, pencil lines put on with a, a straight edge, creating certain uh, a rhythmic uh, display of rectangles, and uh, that's it. Robert Motherwell, another, he's almost been deified in our own times, but I suggest that anyone take a look at Motherwell and take a look at Suzanne, and you'll see how far art has fallen. A large picture, perhaps 15 feet wide, 6 feet high, totally one kind of a a slightly purple blue, and there's a black uh, rectangle uh, drawn with a single stroke of the brush from top to bottom, off right center. Now, frankly, it's not saying anything. Chuck Close, a photorealist uh, painting, presumably, it simply looks like an enlarged black and white photograph uh, on the other wall next to the mother well. And, and friends, I'm suggesting that uh, it's, it's mechanical, it has nothing to do with art, it has none of the emotionalism, none of the profundity, none of the symbolism, if you will, that Cezanne has in his exhibition, and perhaps is one of the reasons that so many people are attending uh, that exhibition. You know, perhaps just a reputation. Cezanne, of course, is a, a great name, and that has great drawing power. So why do we have such uh, mediocrity? You know, and I, I'm talking about the pop artists. I'm talking about the Rosenquists, the Johns, the Rauschenbergs. I'm talking about the minimalists talking about the Stellas, the Poonses, the, uh, uh, the Earth artists. I'm talking about the conceptualists. I'm talking about the, the uh, video artists, so-called. Of course, it has nothing to do with art. It's simply technical manipulation. 
and symptomatic of our age. How, how did we come to this? Why are we uh, involved in, in such a terrible mess? Well, it's hard to say where it begins, but it gr begins with, with greed. It begins with the desire for money. It begins with the desire for, for power. And that runs through the whole art world, whether it's the galleries, the museums, the art magazines, the critics, and the artists themselves. Uh, a fact of life is that it is difficult to be profound. It's difficult to be significant. It's difficult to have anything to say. Most people don't have anything to say. You know, as, as, as tragic as, it, as, as that may sound, most people are followers, and the great artists are the leaders. They are the ones with the uh, visual ideas. They are the ones with the emotional statements to be made. So if you don't have very many significant artists, uh, you deal with a, a mediocre mass of artists. Uh, mediocrity also is easier to sell. Mediocrity does not imply any kind of, of depth, any kind of original search. It's perhaps just working on a, developing a theory, developing after a certain uh, manner, in a sense. It, it's working by plan. You know, you know where you're going to go. You painted your first sailboat or your first rectangle blue. Maybe you'll be daring, and you'll paint your next sailboat or rectangle green. Uh, also, when your artwork is predictable, the galleries can sell it more easily. They say, well, yeah, uh, Jasper Johns has been doing beer cans. He's going to be doing paintbrushes stuck in coffee cans next. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, Poons is, is tilting his spots one way. He's going to tilt them the next way. Stella is, is going into shaped canvases, different width stripes, but he's still doing stripes. And there's this beautiful sense of seeming continuity here. The galleries are afraid of, of, of talent. They're afraid of, I don't want to say genius, because genius is uh, not that uh, common a currency. But let's, let's talk about significance. They're afraid of significance. As Rilke said, uh, genius inspires fear. The establishment is afraid of the new. Number one, they can't sell it. Number two, it may uh, overturn the apple cart that they have nicely rolling along with this mediocre uh, mainstream kind of painting that uh, they have talked people into accepting. Uh, if we come to museums, uh, really people have the wrong idea about museums. They think of them as being the uh, bastion of the masters, that you go there and automatically everything in the museum is worth something. It has some aesthetic value. It has some emotional expressive value. No, of course not. In the recent times, the museums have gotten into competition with the galleries. They're trying to come up with the latest uh, fad, the latest painting that uh, may be. Uh, they're looking for the next crest, the next wave. So there's this sort of vast leveling, this vast commercial aspect to the works that doesn't allow for crest, that doesn't allow for the unexpected, that doesn't allow for genius. And if we talk about uh, the contribution of the art magazines and the critics, uh, they don't, uh, they simply just support the status quo. You look at much of the criticism, and it isn't criticism. They aren't pointing out strengths and weaknesses. They're simply uh, reviewing a show because the gallery perhaps took an advertisement in the magazine. It's as simple as that. Uh, a gallery uh, buys the front page of the art magazine, and uh, my god, they're going to get a good review. They aren't going to get a bad review. But most of the little capsule reviews are non-committal. You know, it's uh, uh, Jason Jones showed his, his recent spatter paintings, uh, very interesting. The drips were uh, expressive of of the tangibility of the paint and the artist's uh, psyche and his id as he went into ego transports and, and, and expressed the luminosities of the universe, whatever kind of verbiage they'll get into. And of course, there's that esoteric verbiage, that sort of closed circle again of, of sort of people who are initiates, who understand what's going on, meanwhile, uh, implying that those of us who don't follow that thinking, who don't uh, follow that language, uh, simply 
aren't intelligent enough to understand what is happening in the art world. Uh, so that the opportunities that have been spoken of for artists, uh, for the real artists, for the significant artists, uh, they're almost non-existent. Those artists are out scrapping. They're going from gallery to gallery with their, their work. They're trying to get people to take it. But generally speaking, the significant artists of today are the realists. And whether they're expressionist or simplifying their realism, they're responding to nature. They're looking at it. And they're having a hell of a time having people look at their work. Because this is not the age of being aware of people. It's not the age of being aware of nature. This is what Cezanne was doing, aware of all of this. And we've lost contact with this. All we have to do is contrast those pictures in the entrance of the Museum of Modern Art with Cezanne's uh, paintings. And, and we see how far we've gone. We talk about who receives the grants. Well, it's these same people, the same people acceptable to the galleries, to the museums, and to the critics, the same closed circle of, of artists. We talk about the art schools. These young art student artists are educated by the artists who are now uh, the names in New York City, and they keep turning out generation after generation of, of, of passive artists who feel that they are on the avant-garde wave of creativity, but who are really uh, the second, third, and fourth generation academicists of our time. In this strange tran transposition of positions, the avant-garde has become the academy. And the sense impressionism, they were the true avant-garde in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. They fought the French academy. And slowly, through the twist of time and fate, the modernists have taken control of the world, the art world, and have become the establishment, the academy, and after, uh, shall we say, a brief period of artistic uh, expressiveness and um, significance, it has dribbled down to the meaningless dregs of a dead artistic tradition. So that all of this is self-feeding, it's, it's self-perpetuating, and the artist that's on the outside that has some, something significant to say, however minor or major, however profound, whether the artist is a genius or merely a sincere, honest person, male or female, young or old, trying to express something about life, which has been completely forgotten. We've forgotten about life. We've learned an awful lot about the airbrush, the uh, straight edge masking tape, and uh, we've forgotten everything else. So all of this is self-feeding. Uh, may I read a, a um, quote by Bernard uh, Champagneau, who wrote a book on Rodin, and in speaking about uh, Rodin and his uh, search for craftsmanship and the great deal of time that he spent on his work, uh, he says, the, quote, age of genius, unquote, uh, has dawned since Rodin's day. Grafsma craftsmanship, we're in the age of craftsmanship now, you know, in that sense. But craftsmanship may be a technical asset, but it is no longer a criterion of value. It has been abandoned in favor of gimmicks and novelties, born of an urge for originality at any price. We'll sacrifice everything, our integrity, our individual identity, for the sake of coming up with something new. This, the newness is, has so destroyed our, our, our personalities and our creativity that we'll sell our soul for some little dribble, some little placement of a rectangle, some little hole in the desert maybe a big hole in the desert, like Michael Heiser. Uh, we sell ourselves for these passing, impersonal, dehumanized values. Society is at fault, but the individual artist, the individual curator of the museum, the individual gallery director, the individual art critic, the individual art editor must bear their responsibility. We must stand up. And, and, and finally be counted as individuals and say, look, the emperor has no clothes, uh, hasn't had any for a long time. Uh, you know, for 20 or 30 years, he was walking around in a jock strap, and everybody thought he had this fantastic robe on. Now he has nothing on, and it's, it's time to call a halt. Getting back to Champagneau, it says this sense of technical craftsmanship has been abandoned in favor of gimmicks and novelties, born of an urge for originality at any price, and nurtured by a mutual conspiracy on the part of critics and commentators who use a specialized and esoteric language to hint at an artist's underlying motivation. 
We've created a structure of words in the art world today. It's no longer visual. Thank you. It's no longer visual. It's no longer what the artist has to say with his brush, with his palette knife, with his sculptural materials. Uh, it is what is written about it. It is uh, the theorizing that goes on either by the artist or by the critics or by the curators or by the gallery directors or by the collectors or the buyers of these works. Uh, I hate to say this, but I think a lot of the people who buy this art are not only insensitive um, to true art, uh, I, I think there's a certain snobbery. I think there's a certain effeteness, uh, a certain closed circle of individuals who somehow feel themselves uh, above the common crowd uh, because they have this marvelous insight into the greatness of the so-called greatness, quote unquote, of these contemporary artists that they collect. Um, whenever I see art treated in the popular media, uh, I cringe because they totally miss the point of what art is, this deep, personal uh, search for each artist. It's a matter of life and death for the sincere artist. It was a matter, literally, of life and death for Cezanne. Uh, for his life to have meaning or not to have meaning. And when, we, when I see a show uh, like the one that NBC had devoted to the arts uh, not too long ago, uh, with the exception of Robert Potts, who suggested that the art explosion uh, was simply an explosion of interest in art, but had nothing to do with any new any profound artistic statements. Uh, it was a dreadful waste. Uh, the reporters didn't know anything about art. They admitted that, and, uh, and this isn't a criticism, uh, criticism of them, but they allowed the establishment people, the Park Burnettes and the gallery dealers, to tell them what art was and what the value of art is in society today, how to buy a painting. Uh, you know, how to make money from painting. That's the new currency in our time. Uh, nothing about what art is as a human document, as a religious statement, as a spiritual statement, as a statement of conscious, uh, conscience, as a statement of consciousness, as a statement of searching for meaning in life. Uh, I, I always think as an artist uh, how the surface is just barely touched by this. Um, the money, 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 money angle of it, the prestige angle of it, the snobbery of it, while well, these artists, and I'm including myself, are out tearing our guts out in our private studios, in our own environments, uh, trying to make something of significance while the world turns and the, uh, the materialism increases and the greed increases and the superficiality. You know, let's talk, uh, life is not all profound. Uh, there, is material and, there are material and spiritual values, but superficiality is, is, a, is a very troubling uh, symptom to, very troubling condition to the significant artist, to the sincere artist, to the genius, whatever we're talking about. We're talking about the artist who is devoting him or herself to art in the attempt to express themselves, to express their feeling about life, to express the meaning of life, if we can say something like that simply without sounding pretentious about it. Perhaps we can have another uh, comment by uh, Champagnol in a book on Rodin. As you can imagine, I just read the book, and so some of these quotes are, are, are fresh in my mind. Uh, in total contrast to the modern artists who exhaust themselves in a quest for original formulae and end by applying the term sculpture to objects. <laughs> what is it, musical cameras here? Uh, in which sculpture plays no part whatsoever. And can you just think of some people like that? Uh, how about the fellow, what is it, uh, Christo with his curtains flapping across canyons and, and who, who wraps the beaches and all that? And of course, it's, it's, it's nonsense. It's part of the decline and decay of our time. Uh, Rodin devoted his youth and a proportion of his maturity to the traditional pursuits of the architectural sculpture, sculptor, dealing with the essential values of mass and volume and expressive form. Let's see if I can come up with a couple of, a couple of other uh, quotes here. Uh, even Rodin, in his own time, 
Uh, a, a quote from Rodin, another few years maltreatment of the ailing past by the murderous present and our loss will be complete and irremediable. My God, how applicable to our own, own time. In terms of some of the difficulty of the significant artist, uh, it's become almost a cliche of the artist suffering in the garret and all this business. And of course, that uh, is a cliche and, for, and forgotten uh, in our own time where we have these instant stars and these, these young, young kids, male and female, uh, have their museum shows and so forth. It's, it's ridiculous. But uh, nonetheless, that's, that's the state of time we're in. Uh, museum shows should be for the mature artist, uh, someone who has spent a lifetime uh, of search and slow building and development, one painting building on another, one idea upon another, and this slow sense of development, not this quick, flashy change from one thing to another as an idea or an artistic means goes uh, out of fashion and another one comes in. Boy, do you see how fast the footwork is on some of these things. That's an uh, obvious sign of superficiality. Uh, let's move to William James. I can, I can see. William James, the psychologist and physician, uh, has described the th three stages encountered by any new medical treatment. But let's, let's uh, think about medicine, but let's also think about uh, art. Uh, the first step, entrenched orthodoxy calls it quackery and non-existent. So that the art bureaucracy, uh, well, the first step really in art is that they ignore it. They don't know anything about it. But once finally, after painful struggle on the art, on the significant artist's part to get his art out where it can be seen, uh, then it will be scoffed at. It'll be laughed at. For example, the minimalists and the pop artists and the earth artists are all together in this thing, uh, whether they realize it or not in this close confederation of similar spirits, the video artists, this, the impersonal, dehumanized people who simply manipulate. They manipulate themselves, they manipulate other people, they manipulate their material. It's a rather cold-blooded affair, and, and perhaps they don't realize this. Perhaps they're, they're lost in their aesthetic uh, endeavors. Perhaps they feel they're on the frontier of human thought. Uh, and I feel that if that's the case, then I think it's a tragic uh, state of, of personal de deception. It's a tragic state of societal uh, deception. Uh, it's, it's tragic that the art world can deceive itself uh, if it does in terms of some of the true values and significance uh, of art. Uh, step two, then it is admitted to exist, this new treatment in, in medicine or the new art, but is written off as unimportant or useless. Okay, maybe I got ahead of myself where they, uh, uh, so that they finally do admit it. It comes into their awareness, their kin, so to speak, and they uh, ignore it. Finally, step three, it's foes, the artistic idea, the artist, the foes of the artist, the idea, uh, the foes of the new uh, medicine, exultantly claim, we help discover it. And now, no, we're, we're not going to go to these pictures. And uh, isn't that what happens in the museums? Isn't that what happens in the galleries? Uh, that artists who are ignored, how many galleries today, and, it's, and of course the Museum of Modern Art, uh, is showing Suzanne. They wouldn't have touched him with a 10-foot pole if he were alive. You know, he comes in there trudging, uh, paint spattered clothes, maybe he's in a bad mood, he's in a rage because he's had a hell of a life and people have ignored him and it's been a hell of a struggle to express himself, to find uh, his meaning in art. Uh, none of the galleries would touch him. I spoke to a gallery person, I won't uh, mention who he is, he handles photorealism, and uh, he said if Rembrandt walked into my gallery, I couldn't show him. Uh, partly, basically, because uh, he has too many artists. Overrun with mediocrity, I would suggest. I would say any gallery in New York City could be swept clean if you could get a Rembrandt or a Cezanne to walk in, an artist of significance. And there are some of these artists. There are some significant artists. I don't know if we have Cezannes and Rembrandts or Van Goghs out, out here, but I suspect that we do. I suspect that they're having a hell of a time. I su su suspect that they're being ignored. And I suspect that one day, 
the establishment will exultantly claim we helped discover these people, just as they have, are doing now for the Latreks, the uh, Cezannes, the Van Goghs, the Soutines, the, you, you name the artists that, that struggled in isolation, uh, the Modiglianis, that kind of thing. Dr. Alexander Fleming, the pioneer of penicillin. You know how many of us have, have saved ourselves from various kinds of diseases with, with penicillin? Dr. Fleming says, penicillin remained on my shelf for 12 years while I was being called a quack by orthodox practitioners. Uh, this is the tragedy of life, the tragedy that mediocrity surfaces, that we live. Uh, this is the tragedy of our materialistic world, that spiritual values, that profound ideas, profound emotions, half the battle for survival. Uh, you know, we all need clothes, we all need the roof on our head, and we can't deny the materiality, corporeality of our bodies. Uh, but we also have this, the spirit, this, the need for meaning in life. And this is the reason that significant artists continue to work, even if only for personal salvation, for the personal expression of their fears and desires and hopes. And I suspect this is some of the nobility that uh, is seen in uh, a Fleming who will devote his research to the development of penicillin and have the courage to wait the time until it is accepted by the slower uh, mass of people. This is the law of life. Thanks. We'll see you later.